You just told me to go louder. Mm. That's okay, there's enough of delay, I think. I think there's enough of a delay that that doesn't matter. But I should have been ready to do this. I can't even see it. Uh, Uh, yeah, it, it, I could have kept the mic off, um, so you would have been fine. My bad. All right, guys. Um, uh, here we are. Day, uh, week, I don't even know. Um, it all runs together in the summer session. Uh, so we have an exam uh, tomorrow uh, in discussion today. We'll do a review, and we'll do a little review uh, tomorrow. Um, in fact, tomorrow in lecture, uh, we'll show you the figure that's going to be on the exam. So you'll see it in advance, and we'll talk about it. Uh, in fact, we'll probably even just post it, because uh, I know sometimes there's a lot to digest on the figure. So we can, I don't care if you see it, you can <laughs> look at it for days as far as I'm concerned. Um, so you can digest the figure uh, tomorrow, um, but we'll go over it uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and in discussion today, we'll uh, have some review and get you ready for the exam uh, Tuesday. So uh, where are we? We are in our roadmap of Chem 1. We are still talking about uh, quantum mechanics and the nature of light and matter. We haven't uh, uh, even got to matter, so we're mostly talking about uh, light, and last time we learned that light was a wave, and we were able to decide light was a wave. We, we knew in advance, we're all, we all live in the modern world, but we were able to uh, have light interfere. Light from two different sources was able to show us constructive and destructive interference, and that's something waves do. So uh, we said light must act like a wave. Uh, then we um, we uh, did a chem quiz and talked about the decrease in uh, intensity of the light. And we said, well, light has this other property that if you decrease the intensity. So you make it dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. It goes down continuously, dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. But then at the very end, it pulses, flashes, blips of light. And those blips had, uh, we call photons. And we give them an energy to each one of them. And the energy is dependent on the frequency. I know that looks, that looks like a V, but that's the frequency, nu, Greek letter nu, and that's Planck's constant. It was uh, Max Planck that uh, essentially determined that light did this. Uh, and we'll talk about that. He didn't, he didn't do this experiment. That wasn't possible. Uh, and you didn't have coherent light uh, back in the day. So the 1920s, uh, we'll talk about uh, how he arrived at that. But that plot is constant, incredibly tiny number, 10 to the minus 34 now meter squared kilograms. So ridiculously small number. So these packages of energy are tiny, tiny, tiny packages of energy. But in the, in the visible spectrum, that's an incredibly tiny package of energy, but we said, uh, our eyes are that sensitive to that tiny package of energy. Uh, if you, and it, 
it kind of has a little bit probably of evolutionary significance that we're sensitive to the packages of light uh, because you know eyes evolved and they evolved to detect those things and even humans that don't have very good eyes uh young human eyes in a very very dark room uh completely dilated can detect that so now we have the entire uh electromagnetic spectrum this is just a visible region uh but we understand that the the um, wavelength times the frequency is the speed, and now the speed is locked at the speed of light. And we can associate an energy with that frequency as well. And we know that that oscillating electric field that uh, creates electromagnetic waves, that can influence an electron. And it can get it moving. Uh, it can get it moving in a wire, and that's how radio, ante radio antennas work. Uh, but it can uh, get it moving in an atom or a molecule. And that's how all of uh, uh, electronic spectroscopy works. This is the nature of how we know what molecules look like. Their structure is based on the fact that electromagnetic radiation interacts with electrons and molecules. Uh, there are no, I mean, you guys, you take it for granted that we know what the structure of molecules look like, but there aren't any molecular microscopes. You can't just, <laughs> in fact, it's funny, you know, in popular culture, if you go to any, any, uh, movie or television show that you go into a lab, you see, uh, someone with a lab coat, uh, white, and invariably they have a microscope because that's a labby thing. And frequently they'll go into it and they'll say oh yes i can see by the structure of your dna you know they'll be looking through their microscope and just you know sh spouting garbage uh you cannot resolve molecules with light uh and we can talk about why that is what resolution is uh we can do it in off stars or something if you're interested but that's impossible to do so there are no molecular microscopes you have to decide how light interacts with molecules, and then deduce, infer from the react interaction what the structure of the molecules are. Uh, that's what I did for my entire uh, uh, PhD career, is studied the structure of biological molecules. Uh, oh, and that's evolutionary. So we were studying the structure of RNA, ribonucleic acid, uh, a, a string of about uh, 50 nucleotides long, and it could cleave itself in half. So it could fold over and cut itself. And without anything else in the, in the solution. In fact, the discovery of that was awarded the Nobel Prize because before that, we thought every reaction that happened in biology was catalyzed by a protein. There had to be an enzyme involved. But the RNA did it by itself. And nobody believed it, of course, <laughs> for a long time. But then we tried to decide what the structure is that allowed it to make that, break that bond. But once you get molecules that can act on themselves, you have, um, you have life, essentially. What, what do we define as life? The most fundamental part of life is I can make a copy of myself. So once RNA can add nucleotides to the end of itself and then cut itself in half, there you go. That's kicked off uh, an evolutionary, just bombard cascade of evolutionary events. Uh, so we talked about the system of perfect radiators. I didn't. Uh, wait a minute. Are we in the wrong? Are we in the wrong lecture? Um, I, maybe not, but that's okay. We talked about the intensity of radiation. And if you emit a lot of wavelengths, and some things are what we call perfect radiators, they emit at all, at all wavelengths. And we found that the peak in uh, their emission spectra 
can be at different ranges in the spectra. We said space, the peak of its uh, radiation emissions, empty space, is down here in the microwave region. And we said that's how we tell that space is at three, two or three Kelvin. It's how we tell the sun is at six or 7,000 Kelvin on the surface, because we can look at the radiation spectrum coming, and it peaks right there in the red and yellow for uh, radiation coming from the sun, which is consistent with something that's radiating at 6,000 Kelvin. And this is actually how Max Planck decided that there were, that the, the energy was granular, that there were photons, there were bits of energy. Because if you, if there weren't bits, if it was just a wave, these curves would continue straight up. They wouldn't come down here. So Max Planck did some mathematical modeling, essentially early mathematical modeling. And he said, well, you could fit this curve. Energy would do this per wavelength if it were granular, if there were steps. But it wouldn't do it if it were continuous, a wave. So he just proposed that there's some kind of granular nature in light, too. Nobody knew what it was, but he did figure out the grain size, photons. H, and that's why the constant's named after him, Max Planck, the constant times the frequency. So what we get to is this idea that waves uh, and electromagnetic radiation can affect electrons. They can get electrons moving. So uh, we need uh, some uh, volunteers again. Do you guys mind coming up and helping me with the, the sheet demo? We have a slightly different sheet demo here today. Uh, uh, camera, we'll bring it right in front of the uh, right in front of the screen so you can keep the default shot. Guys, can you come over here and uh, grab e each one? Grab one end of this sheet. You can grab here. Take this end, and you grab that end. And walk, uh, just, just pick it up, it's no big deal. And walk uh, back towards the center of the room here so we're on camera. Fantastic, I'll stand behind you. Now pull it very tight and very wide. Arm. Oh, you've got nice. <laughs> Resist her. <laughs> uh, and what I want you to do, one of you is going to hold your arms wide and tight. Don't move. And the other one's going to create a wave on the, in the sheet. So uh, you want to be wave creator? So you hold tight and firm. And you just pump your arms up at, at some frequency and just start a wave going across that sheet. Oops, there you go. So there's a wave going across that sheet. You can even see it with the yellow line. And there's an electron <laughs> or anything. This could be a buoy on the ocean. But electrons do the same thing. OK? So stop there. So uh, we're going to keep going, though, in a minute. So let's say we wanted to. Get, make that electron give it more kinetic energy. Get it the heck off the sheet. Or uh, let's say this was a sheet of metal or something. And we want to get the electron not just moving, but kick it off the metal altogether. We know about waves. So uh, what, uh, what feature of the wave should we change to give it more kinetic energy? We have control of the amplitude. We have control of the frequency uh, or the wavelength. Uh, that's what we have control of. Not, we, we even have control of the speed, really, but that's not fair to change the speed if we're talking about electromagnetic radiation. So uh, which, what should we change to get that electron to fly off the sheet? Amplitude. Everybody goes, yeah, make it a bigger wave. Do this. <laughs> Before we do that, <laughs> I like your attitude. Uh, what's your name? Julia is <laughs> ready to rock. She says, let me go. <laughs> Turn me loose on amplitude. But what I want you to do, Julia, first is let's try. I mean, we don't think it's going to work, but our arms wide apart, so it's, it's stretchy. Um, give me a high frequency instead. So just up and down, up and down, just high frequency. So you uh, but yeah, OK, great. That was that was good you saw the wave high frequency <laughs> didn't quite do it but we think high amplitude even if it's at low frequency we probably can do it so let's try to get, launch it out there with high amplitude i got it taped on there really well give it high amplitude there you go pop it, pop it. there you go launch that thing 
I think you're going to get it. There it goes. Nice launch with amplitude. That is very good. Launch that. So that's analogous to, thank you very much, guys. Uh, give them a gallery clap. Yes, that was fantastic. Uh, that's analogous to a wave interacting with an electron on a metal. And I can draw a picture of it. So I can have a wave and I can use, you know, I can use a colored light. So I have different uh, colored light coming in, different frequencies, right? Different frequencies or wavelengths coming in. And it can eject electrons from metals. And they, they go uh, essentially flying off. Uh, Karen, um, can you come out uh, and we can just do this experiment? Karen has it set up. Um, I should have told her photoelectric effect to here is first, because uh, I don't know how to turn any of this on. You probably, probably turn this on. <laughs> That's a light. That's where our light's coming through. Here's our uh, metal source where we're going to shoot the electrons off of. That's just ridiculously bright. There's probably a rheostat here to, oops, I don't want to muck with it. I can probably turn the brightness down. Okay, Karen, it's here to save us. Uh, how do I, how do I, oh, uh, and that, oh, you want to see it. So we're going to be able to see the electrons coming off because uh, they'll create a current and we'll be able to, you know, see the current in the multimeter here. Can we have it not quite so bright? That's crazy. That's the only way you can do it? Uh, oh, we have to be able to change the intensity in I real can, time. I can get a little, uh, let me get up there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll put a. Hold on. We're gonna we're gonna put a alternating vol, uh, a adjustable voltage source on that because we want to we want to do the experiment. We want to. What uh, Julia did down here is she went to high amplitude, but in light, what does high amplitude correspond to? Brighter. So we want to be able to change the brightness and see what happens. Uh, so uh, she'll set that up. As we're doing it, we'll talk about, well, why does it happen? Uh, because it relates to the kind of things that we've talked about. We can imagine that the electron is in. It's on the metal, so it's attached to the metal. It's attracted to the metal. It's attracted to the nuclei on the metal. So it's in a potential well. OK? It's at low energy. We can interact with it with this light, we saw that we could give it kinetic energy. It's just like Chloe Kim in the half pipe. We can give various amounts of kinetic energy to the electron. And all we have to do is give it enough to get outside the well. And we thought we could do that. We could overcome this work function here by Increasing the by giving making it brighter, increasing the amplitude. Is that is that possible now? Uh, where oh it's here. So I can just turn it up. Ah, uh -huh, excellent. Okay, so um, I have a red filter in here. That means uh, only red light will will touch this. So we're we're at the lower frequency end of the spectrum. So we turn it up. And we're looking, we're hoping for, we're hoping for uh, brightness is not helping us. Uh, well, let's just see if we can get it. Let's just see if we can get it to go at all. Let's just use a different color. Let's just go to the other end of the spectrum, blue, the higher frequency. So we'll go down in, uh, and let's see what happens. So there goes my light. Oh. Excellent, we're getting something to happen. So we are ejecting electrons now. We are kicking them off. So this brightness is going to work if I go back to red and that brightness, though. With red, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how bright I go. Amplitude is not working. That sucks. Uh, what, what made it go was the different frequency, the different color made it go, even at relatively lower amplitude. 
So that experiment that Julia did first, she tried to get it off with high frequency. That actually works. So we're at the state right now of uh, chemistry and physics 1923, where we understood light was a wave and had some idea that it was granular and could not explain this, <laughs> just like you guys could not explain this. Uh, we needed a breakthrough, uh, a, uh, someone to look at it in a different way, uh, a genius. Uh, that person was Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein looked at this and he said, oh, uh, I see, if you go to high frequency, the electrons, you can give the electrons uh, kinetic energy, but high amplitude, it, 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 you're getting more energy in there, but it's not good energy. It's not the right kind. It's for something's wrong with it. Well, what <laughs> is wrong with it? We go back to the photon. Now, the blue photon energy, it's higher frequency, so it has higher energy per photon. So what you need is not that high amplitude. You need a photon energy to get you out of the well. It looks like individual photons are hitting individual electrons. And if you hit with a, a red low energy photon, sorry, you don't get out of the well. If it's brighter, what is that? That's just more per second. And if one didn't get out of the well, 100 aren't going to get you out of the well either. So brighter doesn't do you any good. What you need is that big punch of energy from the blue photon. And then you get out of the well. And then if you go brighter, you can have more photons per second. And you get more electrons per second. You get the higher current. More electrons per second being hit and knocked out of the energy well. So uh, many think uh, Albert Einstein uh, won the Nobel Prize. He's so well known for relativity, general and uh, special relativity. Uh, but he won the Nobel Prize for this, for deciding how the, uh, the uh, photoelectric effect worked. He knew that Max Planck had said it's granular, and he knew the granular size that Max Planck uh, had specified so we could do the calculations and kind of say, yeah, various potential wells, various things, this is what you would predict if it were granular. And that predicted the right behavior. Nobel Prize there. So the particulate nature was kind of proven this way. They couldn't do the dimming experiment. They proved it uh, this way. Uh, it's a little known fact. Uh, do you guys know what a, a pea shooter is? You can uh, you know, put like a BB or a little pea in a straw and, <laughs> and shoot it out. Um, it's a little known fact uh, how this uh, originated. So Max Planck and Einstein were friends, and they would go after work you know, at the post office and at the university <laughs> uh, or the patent office. That's where <laughs> Einstein worked. They'd go have a beer at the junkyard. And they'd sit and they would uh, try to break glass at the junkyard. <laughs> you, has anyone ever done that? Just gone and thrown stuff at them? Uh, OK. Well, they were kind of, you know, degenerate. So they're uh, at the junkyard breaking glass. And Einstein is trying to do it with his, his pea shooter. <laughs> and it's hard <laughs> with a pea shooter. So being clever, he, invents, uh, he develops a pea shooter that can shoot multiple peas. <laughs> you know, like an automatic pea shooter. And he goes, and he's all excited, he goes to the junkyard with uh, Max Planck and tries to do it. <laughs> and of course, he realized, and both of them realized immediately, well, if one pea didn't do it, a lot of peas aren't going to do it either. So brightness wasn't going to do it. And Max Planck said, Brightness doesn't, or the pea shooter, your pea shooter do not do it. <laughs> yeah. 
do. He just picks up, you know, a bigger rock and throws it at the glass. And of course, bigger rock, bigger mass, about the same velocity, more energy, a particle, individual particle of more energy, shatters the glass. And Einstein realized, OMG, I get it, I get it, I get it. And he's all excited to go write it down and win the Nobel Prize because he realizes they've discovered, they've figured out the photoelectric effect in the junkyard at, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Berlin. Uh, so there it is, the back, the back story. Very few people know that. Um, very few people know it because I made it up. <laughs> it's not how it happened, but it could have happened that way. You could have seen, you know, Einstein, very excited. Oh my God, oh my God, Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize. <laughs> Jumping up and down, oh my God. Why did that Peter Little so excited? <laughs> Running home to do the, uh, the experiment uh, and write down, he'd do the experiment, he wrote down the uh, answers. But there it is, that's how, uh, it works. But now you are an Einstein. You can figure it out. So here's the red. Uh, that doesn't work. Let's go up to yellow. That's slightly higher frequency. Ooh. Oh, yellow doesn't. Oh, yellow. Oh, look. Yellow will just barely do it. Red won't do it at all. Let's go green. That's higher frequency as well. And yes, now those photons are kicking off uh, the, um, we're, at, we're struggling with focus on the, on the demo. There we go. Green kicks it off and higher intensity, more electrons coming off means more electrons per second, more photons per second, brighter light. All of those things go together. We, it, it all fits together here. And of course, blue, we know we'll do it because that's the highest energy. And yeah, even at low light, you get some electrons and then it correlates well with the uh, brightness of the light. Fantastic. So nice of uh, uh, Karen to get that. Uh, all set up for us. So we understand the photoelectric effect. Um, and we could plot the kinetic energy of the electrons coming off versus the frequency of the light that comes in. And you're not going to be surprised at this. At low frequencies, no, photon, no electrons are ejected because low frequency is not enough energy per photon to kick it off. But then once you kick them off, you will, and you go to higher and higher and higher frequencies, the higher frequency, the extra energy you have above what it takes to kick it off, that of course just makes it go faster. So all this extra energy is the extra kinetic energy between the potential well where it's trapped, the half pipe, and the electron after it leaves. And so here's the cutoff frequency, the, the frequency that's just enough to get it out of the well and barely any kinetic energy. And if you go to a higher frequency photon blue, of course, <clears throat> the blue photon will uh, kick. Let me draw the line. The blue photon would eject an electron with this kinetic energy. But there are different metals. There are different depths of the potential well. So this second line is a deeper well where the blue or the green can no longer get it out of the well. You have to go to even higher frequency to get it out of the well. So this is different materials, different well depth is what you see here, okay? So you can, oops, you can write that down. Uh, energy of the photon is H nu. The kinetic energy that it has is the energy of the photon minus this. Write that 
The rest is kinetic energy. So you subtract away this potential energy bit from the photon energy. What's left is the kinetic energy bit. So the total kinetic energy it can have has to have more than the well, has to have more than the potential. Any more goes into kinetic energy. So very simple uh, equation. And here, I just you could characterize this cutoff, this potential energy, as you know the lowest frequency that will, you know, that will uh, eject a photon, is or eject an electron, would give you that energy. So you could write it in terms of just photon energies too, if you want. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about it. <clears throat> uh, let's talk through this one together. Uh, shining a beam of light on a certain metal has no effect. What change would be likely to eject electrons? And I think you guys uh, already know that. Um, in fact, uh, you can vote on it if you want. Go ahead. Uh, just tell me your thoughts quickly. Um, I think you, you know we just talked through it. I hope you were following me. Yeah, so a lot of you are voting for uh, decrease lambda. Decrease lambda, if you decrease the wavelength, you increase the frequency. That will do it. But you're increasing the, if you're, if you're considering this the photon energy, then that'll work too. Uh, that's a, that one's a little vague because the overall energy in the wave could be the photons per seconds, you know, the energy density of the wave. But the people who are voting this and saying, I'm increasing the, the individual photon energy, you're correct too. You need more photon energy. More brightness won't do it. So more photons per second, so more energy per second, more power does not do it. Exactly. Uh, but let's do this one. Uh, go ahead and uh, uh, teach assistants. So let's talk with our uh, students about this one. We're going to have a combination of two different materials, two different metals, metal number one, metal number two, and they're characterized you know, by their uh, work functions. I didn't say that work function word yet. Work function is, the, is this minimum, it's the depth of the potential well. Uh, so uh, go ahead, guys. You can talk to, about this one. Which combination of a photon striking a metal ejects an electron with the highest kinetic energy? So a yellow photon on this material, a green photon on this material, or a blue photon on this material? Let's talk about that. Uh, do we have some hints? There are some hints if you need them. Um, uh, we'll put the hints uh, up on top so we can keep the quiz here. Uh, if I could have the... Uh, if I could have the... Oh, I do. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's uh, talk about that among ourselves. You talk first.
you guys understand the picture? Those little arrows are the frequency of photons. Red, H nu, that's the energy of a red photon. Green, H nu is a green photon. Yellow would be between red and green. And then blue photon. All right, so uh, let's see what you're thinking. I guess I probably didn't even start the poll yet, but you guys can vote on that if you'd like and tell us what you're thinking. Uh, votes are coming in crazy fast already. I can't even hide them, but that's because you were primed and ready to go. Uh, so let's just look at your responses. Uh, overwhelming, that's fantastic. Overwhelming for green on metal one. Uh, that's what I would hope you would uh, add. You understand this very well. Why is that? Well, we didn't tell you exactly where yellow is. And again, this is the whole idea of schematic plots. You know, when you go on to the exam, it's schematic. There's not an exact number. But you know, yellow falls between red and green. And again, uh, maybe I sh I'll try to put the, I'll put a spectrum on. Uh, remind me, somebody remind me. Uh, send me an email. We'll put a spectrum on the exam sheet or somewhere so you don't have to remember all the color ordering. As We'll just put it on there. Uh, we have to put it on there in color, or we'll label it for the people who have trouble seeing color. Um, so uh, yellow's in there somewhere between the red and the green. So I don't know where, but it's between red and green, so anywhere in there, and it's going to strike metal one so it will eject a kinetic energy, you know, somewhere in here. Okay, just schematically, just about where it would go. Is that enough to compare to green and metal one? Of course it is, because green, I, I said this green. So that green would give you more kinetic energy. It's hitting the same metal, so same potential well, but the photon energy is bigger, and all that bigger goes into more kinetic energy. Okay, the blue is the highest energy photon, but it's striking a metal with a deeper well. So that deeper well robs the electron of kinetic energy, and you get less kinetic energy because more of it had to go into that potential well to get up out of it. Okay, brilliant. So we have light, and we can see now that it has wave properties and particle properties. We have to do different experiments to resolve them. The, the interference experiment we saw gave the wave property. The photoelectric effect experiment and every other experiment uh, in spectroscopy gave us the, the granular nature. The, the particle nature of light. So we have a wavelength lambda at a speed c. That's how that looks. That describes a wave. E equals h nu, e equals hc over lambda. We get that. So E is hc over lambda. Particles, if it were a particle, it seems like you should be able to give it a momentum <laughs> because it's a particle and it has a velocity. So we'd like to be able to assign it a momentum if we can. We've assigned it an energy, kinetic energy. And you know how close kinetic energy is to momentum. That has, both of them have the m and the v in it. 
So a particle flying across the screen has momentum, and we give that the symbol P, and it has m times v is how you write momentum, m mass times velocity. The energy is 1 half mass velocity squared. The momentum is mass times the velocity. The trouble is, what's the mass of those, the mass of those little things? Well, the mass of those little things is hard, to, uh, is hard to get at. We can say, well, I'll write it down, but I don't know what it is. And uh, so I'll give it this little star. And, but its speed is the speed of light. We know how fast it's going. It's on the wave, it's going the speed of light. But if I go m and square the speed, now I'm talking about the energy. Right? mc squared would be proportional to the energy. That's the kinetic energy, 1 half mc squared. So now you can see Einstein in there. <laughs> he said, why did he win that Nobel Prize? <laughs> Equals mc squared. So the, if you assume some kind of rest mass, some kind of mass, and now you could calculate a number for it. You can take the photon energy, divide by the speed of light squared, and assign a rest mass to a photon. Photons never stop, though, so rest mass doesn't uh, mean anything. But you can keep going along and saying, well, that mc squared equals the momentum times, you can see mv is in there. mv is momentum times another c is mc squared. So m, m times c, momentum, times c is mc squared. And that has to equal hc over lambda because that's the energy if it's going to be a wave at the same time. So now we get an, a relationship between the momentum and the wavelength of the light. And the wavelength is the most common thing we can measure. So it's handy to correlate this, this thing, the momentum of the particle. So, and we have to put particle in quotes. It doesn't stop. It doesn't have a anything we can quantify. It has uh, doesn't really have, even have a mass. The, the, the particle is, by definition, massless. Photons don't have any mass. But you can define this pseudo mass thing uh, from this expression, the, the relativistic mass, uh, rest mass of the photon. But we get rid of it altogether. When we talk about the mass, we just combine it and say, Whatever this property is, this momentum that it transfers to electrons, the momentum that you transfer to the electrons is H Planck's constant divided by the wavelength. So handy. So particles have momenta equal to H over lambda. Waves, uh, well, waves, we should be able to say now the same thing. If you were going to assign a momentum to a wave, you would do it the same thing. You would say the wavelength is given by the momentum of the particle. So the fundamental property of a particle, its momentum, is defined by the wavelength. The fundamental property of a wave, its wavelength, is related to this momentum. OK? So this. Dual, this duality, particle and wave properties are related by the momentum. Right? And of course, Planck's constant, we know that. That was a tiny number of joule seconds. Okay, so let's uh, split a photon. So we're going to take a photon at 400 nanometers, and you can actually do this experiment. Uh, I don't think there was a Nobel Prize associated with uh, uh, photon splitting, but you can get it from a lot of different ways. Uh, but it can be done in cool ways. So you can take uh, a photon and, and interact it with certain materials and divide it up into parts. So a blue one comes in, and you can have a red one 
red photon, essentially blue, blue wavelengths go in and red wavelengths come out. Uh, but it splits it in two, and I want to know what the wavelength of this one is. OK? So let's talk about that. Go ahead, uh, teaching assistants. Let's talk about that among the uh, people here. I see if there's some hints for that one. I forget. Uh, yes. If you need a hint, uh, there are some here on uh, the board to give you an idea. Uh, I don't remember if I have my mic on or not. OK, go ahead and vote on this. There's the uh, possible uh, options. Uh, vote when you're ready. You've had a, a few minutes to talk about that. Uh, the hints. are up there. <laughs> while you're voting, uh, yeah, we'll just uh, talk about it while you're voting. Where are the, where are the hints? Uh, I don't, why don't I see the hints? There they are. Uh, let's just go through uh, the hints. And you guys, if you're at home and you're in bed watching me on the live stream uh, uh, or at the breakfast table with your parents. I hope you are uh, looking at <laughs> the chemistry live stream. Uh, uh, you could just, you know, look at these. You can decide if you're not sure which one of these makes the most sense to me, and explain it to your uh, parents or your dog or your roommate, uh, whoever will listen. Uh, splitting of a photon must reduce the wavelength. So 200 is the only. 200 was one of the answers. 200 is the only smaller wavelength than 400. So wavelength had to go down. You're splitting up wavelengths, maybe. Uh, energy is conserved. That's always true, OK? Remember, if you're an engineer, you see a problem in front of you, what do you do? Conserve energy, conserve mass, <laughs> and then work from there. Those two things are true. So conserve energy, well, if you are going to conserve energy, Energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. It's directly proportional to the frequency, right? It's h nu. So it's h over lambda is the energy. Proportional, you need, you need a Planck's constant and the speed of light. But Planck's constant and the speed of light would be on, in the numerator in all of those. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, I like that. The sum of the wavelength must add to the longest wavelength. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's not, you, could, you might think that's true. That, that one would be tough to disprove at this level of your 
of your uh, understanding. But energy is conserved should be a big, let's go with that one. <laughs> if I see energy is conserved, I'm happy. So you do conserve energy. You have a energy of a photon in this. You have two photons over here, or two waves. So conserve energy. H times nu of the 1200 plus some other wavelength, uh, well, other frequency that we don't know is H times the 400 nanometer frequency. That's why I said the frequency of a 400 nanometer light, frequency of 1200 nanometer light would give you the frequency of the unknown photon. But of course, uh, you can put C over lambda for the frequency. So now you have it in terms of wavelength. And all you know, all you uh, don't know is the unknown wavelength. Cancel out all the H's, cancel out all the C's, speeds of light, and uh, just solve it. H over 1200. This uh, 3H over 1200, I had to make them all the same uh, denominator. 2H over 1200, I had to uh, go there. That's what the only thing that made sense. 1h over 1200 plus 2h over 1200 is 3h over 1200. So that photon has uh, twice the energy, half the wavelength of this one, 600 nanometers. OK, brilliant. Apparently, we're going to do that again in discussion. So let's go. I think we just go on to the next thing. I guess I did that a little fast, but I think, yeah. Yeah, we go on to the next thing. Uh, as you know, um, the, uh, is this the next thing? The, uh, the exam tomorrow night uh, covers just up through uh, the end of homework uh, 20, or lecture 20, uh, and we're into 22 almost now here, I think. Uh, so this material itself isn't on here, but all this stuff about waves, I mean, you have to know about waves, properties of waves for, uh, you have to know about conservation of energy for the exam. So everything we're talking about here is, uh, the, the concepts are there, but the photoelectric effect itself won't be on the exam. So again, we're, we're down here in quantum mechanics and the nature of matter and light. We're going to try and understand uh, more about matter and light. So we had this is our quintessential, uh, you know what that word means, the um, most representative uh, experiment to determine if something's a wave. If you want to know if something is a wave, all waves interfere with each other. So you can look for constructive and destructive interference that is evidence that the thing you're looking at is a wave. You can detect constructive or destructive interference. And we know all waves do that. We, we've seen it a couple ways. Uh, let's look at just uh, water waves first. Can I make this bigger? Yes. OK, there it is, gigantic. And you can switch over so the people at home don't have to look at um, me in front of this. But here you have, uh, let's, just, um, let's just do one wave. So I'm going to have one, this little ball here is going up and down, and it's creating a wave on this, uh, in this material. It could be water. It could be a pond. You're just creating a wave by disturbing the surface. And the waves radiate out through that surface. Uh, you can do that with two waves. I can start another one. Ooh, and that diagram gets nasty already. I'm going to show the sum instead and get rid of the individual two waves. Now I have both waves, and the picture I'm looking at is the sum of the waves. And we know we can add waves. And if a wave crest hits another wave when it's at a trough, it cancels out, destructive interference. And you can see that happening here. Which view do I want? There's, 
There's the side view. So now you're looking at the waves coming at you. And look at how this ball, that ball is being hit by constructive interference of those two waves. But look at this ball just right over here. It's in a spot where there's destructive interference of the waves. And it's in a node. It's not moving. That's the top view. What does the 3D view look like? That's this one. Let's look at the top view again. So there's the top view. And the top view is lovely because you can see the destructive interference right there. You can see how the water is calm right there. But here, there's wave fronts coming and hitting that particle. So all waves do this. We're not surprised that light waves do it. Um, show node regions. Ah, there they are. Here is where you're adding to zero destructive interference. And here, constructive interference. That's neat. Show anti-node regions. Those are the regions where it's positive, your constructive interference. So there's the constructive interference. And you can even see that ball oscillating and that ball still. OK? There it is, this ball bouncing up and down, that ball that's on a node is still. Uh, node, that ball isn't moving, OK? So this interference thing is just a property of waves. Luckily, we can detect it in, um, oops, uh, the best way to do that. Actually, sorry. There's another, uh, uh, another animation. We uh, tried to look at it with lasers as well, coherent light. So let's see if this one will let us go to full screen. So here's the experiment we did. We had two slits, and we had waves traveling towards the two slits, but they had to go different distances. So by the time they got there, and they're red and blue here, but that's not two different frequencies here. It's just so you can distinguish them. So these are the same frequency light uh, coming towards that. And uh, uh, what's the best way to use this one? I think if I just let time go, yes, there they go. As time goes, they approach, but look, the red one gets there first because it had the shorter path to go. Then the blue one catches up. And when the blue one catches up, it catches up, and they're both in phase. They're both up and down together up and down together, up and down together. So you get them adding. And if you keep going, you'll see the sum of them. They get there in the same phase. So the sum of them is this constructive interference at that point on the screen, simply because they had different path lengths. That's a cool one. Uh, what if their amplitudes were different? Giving red a big amplitude doesn't change much qualitatively because it's still uh, they still are constructively interfering. How could we make them destructively interfere on this? Let's give them the same. I haven't used. I just found this one. Oh, we'll just we'll just put them out of phase. Oh, doesn't let me do that. Uh, what can I change? Oh, the wavelength. Uh, can, oh, that's probably going to be hard, though. I, if the wavelengths are different, it won't let me change that either. What can I change? Oh, maybe it has to be running. Stop. Stop. Now can I change wavelength? No. OK. All right, maybe I can't change things. Uh, 
Pause. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> well, that's no fun. <laughs> uh, this morning I was playing with that and changing stuff. Uh, it let me drag time. Doesn't let me drag any of these other things. How about if I uh, don't do that? No. Okay. Well, we could probably restart it and get it to work, but uh, we saw what we needed to see. So that is the nature of waves that we expect to see this constructive and destructive interference. So that's great. And we know electromagnetic radiation is a wave. What if we did this experiment, though, with something we knew was a particle? So we take particles and launch them at a screen with holes in it. Well, uh, intuitively, well, you know what's going to happen. It, it's Einstein and his pea shooter. Pfft, he's spraying particles at. Some of them will go through this hole, and some of them will go through that hole. And if you look where they'd hit on the screen, you'd have a bunch of them hit here somewhere, and a bunch of them hit over here somewhere. And they're just particles. All they can do is go through the holes. They'd spread out. They'd spread out some because you know the particles can hit, you know, glance off the sides of the the material, so they'd spread out some, but basically they'd all be here or here. So no, we wouldn't expect, and that, yeah, we go, duh, <laughs> particles don't interfere with each other. I can't take, add amplitudes of particles and get this. So <clears throat> particles, there's a stream of particles just whacking into that. These guys don't get through at all, and then some get through these holes, but they wouldn't make that. They would make, we would expect them to make a bunch of particles would hit here, and a bunch of particles would hit here, because these are going through that hole, and those are going through that hole, and that's what you'd expect to see. And that is what you see. I'm not, no, your, your intuition is correct for particles. Uh, but, Tiny, 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 tiny little particles. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you know why we're going all through this. When you do this experiment with electrons, you do get this. The electrons, even though they're particles, they seem to just hit at these places on the screen. They don't hit here, and they don't hit here, and a lot of them hit here, and hardly any of them hit here, and a lot of them hit here, and hardly any of them hit here. So even though they're individual particles, and you can do this, you can, you can have a phosphorescent screen, and you can have a beam of electrons, and the beam of electrons, and then just watch, they, they make the screen glow when they hit it. So you can see where they hit, bing, 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 bing. And you would not expect this to happen. They're particles. You would expect them to do the particle thing. But they do not. They do this. The electrons, the particles interfere with themselves somehow. That is very strange. That's worse, in my mind, than finding out that the light had particle properties. Thinking that matter had wave properties. That's startling and annoying. But you can demonstrate that it happens. The probability that they hit here is high. The probability that they hit there is low. So in some sense, they're interfering with each other. So you get kind of a probability distribution. You can take the square of the amplitude of these areas, and that would tell the relative frequency, how many particles hit at each place, the probability density of the distribution from the square of the amplitude of the distribution. You could write it as a wave function. We saw we could write wave functions like this. Especially if we square them, they look just like that. So we can have a wave function. If we square it, we kind of expecting a probability. So this is where it gets, this is where it starts to get a little annoying. So the, if, if something's behaving like a wave, and I write down its wave function, and then I square it, and I look at the peaks, that's the most likely place the particle hits. 
but that's the most likely place to find the particle. That's what this is kind of telling us, and that's this is what we're we're getting from that. The conclusion we're getting from that. So amplitude squared of waves is proportional to the probability of finding a particle there, particle having hit there. That is not how you expect matter to behave. You don't expect you roll the dice to see if the, if the electron hits there or not. You expect you should be able to just say it went through this hole, it should hit there. But it doesn't. It behaves like a wave. And it turns out you could kind of rationalize it. You're, I think you're starting to rationalize it. You're saying, OK, the electrons go through. They have some kind of wave behavior. And then that wave behavior gives constructive or destructive interference somehow. <laughs> What's going away? I don't know. The matter, I don't know. And then it hits uh, the screen. But you know, if one electron goes through each hole, you, know, you could expect maybe they somehow interfere with each other. And that's, that's actually a reasonable way to think about it. They go through each hole and their waves. So they give that. That's a good explanation. And you don't have to know this part, but I'll just tell you it's weirder than that. You can dim the electron source so that you can be assured that one electron is going through one hole at a time. So no, at no time do two electrons go through the holes at the same time. So they can't interfere with each other. They can't do the wave thing. If you wait a long time, one electron at a time, you wait, 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 hours, you know, because you need to collect lots of electron, you still get this. One electron at a time. So it's, it's spookier than even, you know, their waves interfering with each other. <laughs> Gives you the willies, OK? You don't have to worry about the willies part. You just have to know that they behave like waves, OK? I'm never going to ask you a question about one particle at a time or anything like that. Just electrons somehow behave like waves, and we demonstrate that here. OK? Uh, but we're at that point. We understand other things waves can do. So we've been able to take a wave, and we've been able to assign to the wave this thing. I didn't, I didn't say these words. This de Broglie relationship, the momentum is related to the wavelength. And that's a particle behavior. So if you have one wave, you have a very well defined momentum, right? One wave, one momentum. But if this is a particle, you got to ask yourself, well, where the heck is the particle? If you took the square of that, there's lambda. There's one momentum. There's lambda. If you square this wave function, I'm telling you that's where the particle is. But you square that wave function, and all you get is that, <laughs> where the, the particle is spread out over all of space. Okay, Almost an equal probability of finding it anywhere, at any of these peaks, you might find the particle. So a single momentum spreads the particle everywhere. There's the how we draw it. Remember, we kind of color these things. So this is uh, all the areas of positive amplitude. There's areas of negative amplitude. But so you know, here the wave function was positive. Here it was negative. Here it was positive. Here it was negative. Here it was positive. Here it was negative. But the square of the wave function is the square of the positive and the negative lobes. And it looks like the particle is everywhere if it has one wavelength. And that's kind of like the that's that's very analogous to the photon. Where is the photon on the wave? The photon is everywhere on the wave. Spread out over the wave. That's annoying if it's a particle. You don't want the particle to be spread out everywhere on the wave. But what if you did this? What if there were lots of wavelengths? And we already know we can do this, right? If you sum a lot of different waves, you can get the amplitude to condense into one spot, can't you? We saw that with our, with our waves, our Fourier transforms. I don't think I call it a Fourier transform. But we know we can add, add up waves, and we can get something with 
when we squared it, it looks like this concentration of the amplitude if we take lots of waves lots of different wavelengths but what happens now we don't know the wavelength it could be any of a million different things it can be billions and the more the more wavelength you take the more precise you can make that peak so just this property of waves, you can add them together to do this, tells us something about matter as well, if we believe matter is behaving like a wave. If matter behaves like a wave, then this better be what happens. So if there's a spread of momenta, you don't know what the momenta actually is, lots of different momenta, you can tell where the particle is. So if you confine it by space, you lose information about the wavelength. You lose information about the momentum. But if you try to define the momentum down to a single value, you lose information about where it is. That's true for all waves. If we believe this, uh, this amplitude thing, just the amplitude argument is true for all waves. We're saying probability of finding the particle, where the particle is, then we're saying it's a matter wave. This is the result. And this, more certain position with less certain momenta, certain momenta, less certain position, those things are inversely proportional. The, the better you know the momenta, the less uh, you know the position. The better you know the position, the less you know the momenta. And that's something famous you might have heard of before. The spread in position times the spread in momenta, those are inversely proportional to each other. And their product is something like Planck's constant for particles. But this isn't anything. I'm sure in your previous, uh, has anybody seen this before, the, this famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle? When you saw it the first time, somebody just pulled it out of their, <laughs> some orifice of their body. <laughs> and they just told you it was true. It's true for waves, and you have seen. I, I added them together, and I got this. And now you can see, well, that, of course, if the particles behave like a wave, that has to be true. So just by knowing something about waves, we understand something about matter. It's a very weird property of matter that it's just a weird property of matter. If, if the matter is tiny, and, and here's where we get to the whole idea. When does matter behave like a wave? When is it important to think about when it behaves like a wave? Well, you know how tiny Planck's constant is. So what you need are tiny, tiny, tiny momenta. If I, if I took this momentum and I divided it over here, if I want to know where the particle is, take that spread of momentum over there, that has to be really small to have divide into H and get a, you know, a position number, a small position number over here. So what you need, if you're worried about, is my particle going to be like a wave? Well, if it has tiny momenta, sure as heck might. OK? You can see it here, too, the uh, momenta proportional to the wavelength. The length of the wave determines the size of the momenta. And that tells us something about when we have to worry about wavelength. So this allows us to understand this. Remember, we had that diffraction, uh, that diffraction thing. You put particles through here. <laughs> Went one too far, one too fast there. When you, back, if you have particles going through a slit, if you change the width of the slit, you have a effect on how they spread out. That diffraction part. There's two things that are happening. Remember, diffraction and interference. The diffraction part just depends kind of on how narrow the slit is. If you have a big, huge slit, then you don't get any edge effects, and this is a very tight distribution. 
you get that slit narrow, then the balls or whatever could bounce off the edges more and they would spread out more. But the same thing happens with the wave. You get narrower and the distribution, the diff diffraction increases. But we know why that is now. We won't do this chem quiz, we'll just talk through it. If the particles coming through, what are you doing if you're constraining that? Well, you're saying, I'm gonna let you go through there, but I'm gonna say, well, you have momenta in all directions. Your X momenta is limited. Uh, well, we we'll put it the other way. Your X position, in, if this is the X direction, if I'm limiting your X position by making that hole smaller, I limit the X position, so I have more specific X positions, what happens to the spread of your momenta in the X direction? That gets bigger if you say, I have to go through a smaller hole. Smaller hole, more certain X, less certain momenta in the X direction. So if you have a bigger spread of momenta with a littler hole, you'd get a bigger, this is the, this is the X momenta, remember. So as they're going through here, X momenta is what spreads them out, their momenta perpendicular to where they're traveling. Okay? So we understand diffraction now in terms of uncertainty, but un in terms of a wave property. That's another beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful thing. We won't uh, look at that. So here I did a smaller hole, uh, decrease in the uncertainty in the X position. Bigger delta X means bigger delta P. This smaller makes this bigger because their product has to be a constant. It's just like pressure and volume. Pressure gets bigger, volume had to get smaller. X position, more constrained, momenta less constrained. Oh my God, this is, now we're talking, now, now we're talking fundamental science. Uh, weird fundamental science, but cool nevertheless. Uh, so tomorrow, uh, I have to keep talking to you. I'm gonna be here at, uh, when is discussion? 11. 11, I'm gonna be here at 11 and I'll lead discussion and help you guys through uh, for the exam prep for tomorrow night. Uh, and I'll see you tomorrow morning. We'll talk about the exam a little bit then too.